Okay, so you've been the first Australian cinematographer who got Oscar after Bobby Krasker, so it was Dancing with Wolves, right? Yes. So, can you tell us about this film, because uh, what, how it all started, what you did, what you've been thought about when you got a script? I had a, I had a call from uh, my agent to, that Kevin was making a film, uh, a Native American film, and he wanted to meet me. So I went to meet him, and I met with him and, and uh, Jim Wilson, his producer and partner. We met at Rally Studios, and it was a, it was a good meeting. It felt right. Um, and uh, then I got the offer. Like a week or two later, the agent got the call that I, Kevin wanted me to do it. Um, we discussed anamorphic versus 185. Kevin initially wanted to shoot at 185 because it was a very personal story. And uh, I said, we ought to do some, maybe you ought to do some tests. Um, and I think, I, I, I think we went up to South Dakota or somewhere and shot 185 versus 240. And it was obvious that it had to be a wide screen because it was about the land and the sky. So we decided to do that. Shooting the makeup and wardrobe tests, I'll never forget. It was like a basic little concrete vacant store in Pier in South Dakota. Um, and I laid a track down and I had an e-fan and I lit fairly dramatically. So this was the first time we we're going to see all of the actors in their wardrobe and in their makeup. And it was just extraordinary. They came in and, I mean, you see drawings and sketches, but the real people walked in. And um, I did little dollies in, dollies out. And Kevin had about six or seven different looks. And I think I side lit it. It was all pretty nicely side lit. And the little e-fan e e would blow the hair or blow the feathers. And, and they were still very technical, though. We, you know, people were looking at wardrobe, people looking at the makeup, people, etc. cetera. Uh, we came to screen it in the uh, hotel. We had a projector in there. We, um, we screened the uh, tests, the wardrobe makeup tests, in a, in a you know, convention hall in a hotel. And Kevin had a theory about great images. He said, no matter how good your image is, you're going to need sound to keep it up there. Eventually, you're going to get sick of seeing it. It's going to slide down. So he played during these makeup wardrobe tests, when we were shooting him, he played music, generally from like classic Western movies like Lonesome Dove and uh, Man from Snowy River. And the lights came on at the end of, of the makeup wardrobe tests, which are pretty technical, and people were crying. It was just such a, was such a fabulous feeling. It was so emotional watching these people just turn their heads, the wind would blow the feathers, and it was pretty special. We knew it was special then, but we had no idea at that stage, of course, that it would lead to the Academy Awards the way it did. And, uh, the shoot was tough. We started in Pier, where the buffalo were, where the buffalo roam, and uh, it was summer and it was very hot. Um, no matter how tough it was for, for us, for everybody, for the crew, you've got to think of Kevin and how tough it was for him, because Hollywood were going to Hopefully he was going to fall flat on his face because he was a big 800 pound gorilla then and he was Mr. Wonderful. Uh, um, he was responsible for financing. I mean, he had to fight that. Plus he was producing it. Plus he was directing it. Plus he was a star. He was in it. And I didn't realise until I really saw the movie for the first time how he nailed his character, character development from the beginning through to the end. What an extraordinary job he did. It's tough, you know. Uh, he was very gracious and generous with uh, the Native Americans because a lot of them were professional actors and he gave his all to them. Uh, he was very concerned about safety. Uh, I don't know why he rode in the buffalo hunt. <laughs> I don't think the insurance people were madly happy about that. But he said, I want to do it because it hasn't been done for a hundred years. And he did it, he came off his horse as well, uh, in amongst the buffalo. And uh, I think one of the other horses hit him and he knocked him off his saddle. And uh, he got back on again and continued. But, uh, and it got bitterly cold towards the end. We did go over, we went over, the shoot went over, but Kevin wasn't going to lose anything. He wasn't going to lose any scenes. Uh, the completion guarantors kept a close eye on us and say, you know, we can take a few pages out. It's maybe the only script I've ever had that didn't have any other coloured pages in it or anything taken out. It was the way it was. Nothing was, nothing was taken out and we shot it all. 
And by the time we finished, it was uh, just before Thanksgiving up in Rapid City, it was freezing cold, icy, icy, icy cold. We had one shot to do, I had a Musco light up there, lighting a night scene we were doing. And the generator went down. The generator went down on this thing and we, we were so close to finishing. People were tired. A lot of us had walking pneumonia and Kevin was exhausted. I mean, doing that every day for 110 days or whatever it was. But uh, anyway, the generator fired up and we all finished the movie. But I didn't realise how good it was going to be until I was shooting City Slickers and the word came down that they had had some test screenings and that there could be some nominations there. So that's the first I heard. Then I was in Sydney when uh, the nominations came through and all of a sudden the press are on you like, boy, it's uh, interview after interview after interview and it even got worse after I won the Academy Award. Uh, I remember flying home on Qantas and I loved flying Qantas because they have Vegemite. No other airline has Vegemite. We're flying back and the steward said, uh, Mr. Semler, do you have it with you? And I said, well, he's at the Oscar, do you have it? I said, yes, I've got it here. So I, do you think um, it'd be prudent to uh, take it through the plane and show everybody? And I said, oh, come on, people have been flying for nine hours and the toilets are overflowing and everyone's tired and grumpy. They don't want to see someone holding a trophy up in front of their face. She said, I think you will find they'd appreciate it. So I did. And then it was, uh, it was obvious how much it had meant to my country. There were photographs and things and stuff and people loved it. And then when I got back to Sydney, it was, uh, it was on there with the press and interviews. And I was in the outback, way in the outback, on a scout for a movie on my own, driving a little Aussie car. And I stopped in to get petrol to fill up with gas. And it wasn't a credit card, it was pay cash, tiny little one horse town. And I gave the money to the guy and he said, no, mate. He said, this one's on me. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this one's on me. We're real proud of what you did. And I drove away. And I saw him in the rear vision mirror just giving me a wave. I thought, holy hell, that's a moment in my life, you know. It was wonderful. <laughs>